is the first item on our agenda, which is the joint debate concerning climate change. Council and Commission statements, climate and environmental emergency, and oral questions to the Council and the Commission, 2019 UN Climate Change Conference. I remind you that it's possible to request KDI and blue cards using both the standard registration and the electronic system. Instructions are available at the entrance of the hemicycle. Colleagues, I would like to ask you if you are leaving the plenary to do it quietly so we can proceed with the agenda. Thank you very much. And I first would like to give the floor to the presidency, Minister, Mr. Tilikainen. The floor is yours, please. Madam President, Honourable Members of European Parliament, I wouldn't like to interrupt your fruitful discussions, but uh, I'm supposed to present some Council uh, opinions referring to the item we are discussing today. So clearly, planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. This statement was released on 5th of November by 11,000 scientists from 153 nations. The climate crisis is accelerating faster and more severely than anticipated. This statement, I quoted, is in line with the recent special reports of the IPCC, according to which human-induced warming has already reached one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels and is increasing at approximately 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade. By the end of the century, based on the current climate policies implemented worldwide, temperature is projected to rise to 3.1 to 3.7 degrees. It's clear that progress so far is insufficient and efforts should urgently be stepped up. The United Nations indicates that the NDCs submitted by parties to the Paris Agreement collectively fall far short of what is required to limit the rise of temperature to 1.5 degrees. The overall situation is rather bleak, yet there are some encouraging signs, including global birth rate, investments in solar and wind power, and fossil fuel divestments. Moreover, there is growing awareness and concern about global warming and its effects. All over the world, active civil society coalitions, citizens, and the youth in particular, are calling for decisive action that will determine the future of the planet and humanity. We have heard their appeal to implement the paradigm shift to climate-proof circular economy that our economies and societies urgently need in order to mitigate the most catastrophic consequences of climate change. The Climate Action Summit in September demonstrated the political will to step up collective ambition. It resulted in a number of major announcements by governments and private sector leaders, including at EU level, on the reduction of greenhouse gas reduction, climate finance and carbon neutrality. President, honorable members, as regards the Paris Agreement, the EU is preparing its long-term strategy for greenhouse gas emissions uh, reductions that will be submitted to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change 
by 2020. Most member states agree with the objective of climate neutrality in the EU by 2050, and several of them have already set national targets contributing to that goal. The European Council is committed to finalising its guidance on the EU's climate neutral vision before the end of this year, with a view to reaching an agreement by all member states. The road to climate neutrality in the EU will affect everyone and will require efforts from all sectors of the economy. It's therefore essential that the transition must be just and socially balanced and that no one is left behind. It is equally essential that to scale up the investment in research and development in, if the EU wants to reap the opportunities in terms of growth and employment that climate neutrality will trigger. The EU has taken the lead in implementing the Paris Agreement. We are set to overachieve our 2020 20% reduction target. The climate and energy legislative framework is designed to enable us to reach the 2030 target. That involves a reduction of domestic greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% below 1990 levels. And actually, thanks to parliaments, councils and commissions' good cooperation, we were able to increase the ambition level up to minus 45% uh, while finalising climate 2030 files. The EU has successfully decoupled economic growth from emissions. From 1990 to 2017, the EU's economy grew by 58%. Total greenhouse gas emissions decreased by 22%. A recent report by the European Environment Agency indicates that the EU's total emissions decreased by 2% in last year. This brings the total reduction to 23.2% below 1990 levels. Ladies and gentlemen, by promoting this positive example, we can inspire all parties to the Paris Agreement to raise the global ambition. It is in that spirit that the EU actively prepares for COP25. We call on all parties to update their NDCs and to increase their clarity, transparency and understanding. COP25 will test the willingness of all parties to finalise the implementation of the Paris Agreement. The rule book has been almost totally agreed at in Katowice last year, with the important exception of the rules on voluntary cooperation in Article 6. As agreed by the Council on the 4th of October, the EU is committed to working with all parties to develop robust and comprehensive rules on voluntary cooperation. The EU's core position in this respect is to agree on rules on internationally transferred mitigation outcomes that encourage ambition and progression in NDCs, guarantee environmental integrity, avoid double counting, and provide for the closure of the Kyoto Protocol mechanisms. And finally, dear friends, the fight against global warming needs adequate financial means and resources, which are key for increasing global ambition and for facilitating the transition to climate smart economies. The EU is the world's biggest climate finance contributor. The contributions of the EU and its member states exceed 21 billion euros annually and fulfill their commitment towards the mobilization of $100 billion per year by 2020 through to 2025 as part of the collective developed countries goal. The Council has recently adopted conclusions on climate finance. The Council reaffirmed the commitment of the EU and its member states to engage in deliberations on setting a new collective quantified goal from a floor of $100 billion per year prior to 2025. The deliberations are to take place in November 2020 with an aim to make global financial flows consistent with the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement. The Council also stresses the importance of the need for a wider variety of funding sources 
and for a broader range of contributors. As you can see, we have an important and dense COP25 ahead, with a lot of items to be discussed. Let me assure you that the European Union will play an active role in these discussions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Now I would like to give the floor to the Commission, Commissioner Arias Cañete, please. Madam President, Minister, Honourable Members, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this timely and topical debate on the pressing issue of climate and environmental emergency while we look ahead to preparation for the upcoming 25th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Madrid, led by the Government of Chile. Climate change and the environment are a top priority for our citizens and in particular for our young people. Science is clear. Each year matters. Each choice matters and each half a degree matters. There is utmost urgency to act. Fires have raged from the Amazon to Siberia. Heat waves, droughts and cyclones are affecting billions of people throughout the world. Climate change and the biodiversity losses are already now affecting critical life systems on Earth, threatening livelihood of many. Together with you, we have put in place a comprehensive climate and energy framework and have delivered on our objectives in the Circular Economy Action Plan, but we need to do more. We need much, much stronger action, as sign as our youth keep reminding us. The European Union is strongly committed to continue an ambitious and urgent action to effectively address the interdependent environmental and climate crisis in an integrated manner, globally, because this is essential for sustainable development, poverty eradication, and delivering on all the sustainable development goals. On the environmental side, we need to engage all partners in bringing about the transformative change that is necessary for our planet's survival. We must make 2020 a landmark year for climate, nature and ecosystems, including through an ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework to be adopted at the Conference of the Parties under the Convention for Biological Diversity in Kunming in China. On climate, we must continue our efforts and accelerate our action in the European Union and globally. Four years ago, the international community celebrated the Paris Agreement as a game changer. And last year, we agreed on the Katowice Rulebook, the first ever universal transparency and accountability system applicable to all with inbuilt flexibilities for those who genuinely need it. Both Paris and Katowice are landmarks for multilateralism and a true testament of global resolve and solidarity. Looking ahead to Madrid, completing the work on making the Paris Agreement work well in practice must be our first collective objective. In this regard, a key topic for COP25 is the single element of the rulebook left outstanding in Katowice, the guidance on voluntary cooperation and market-based mechanisms under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Securing a meaningful outcome for market measures under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement is important for the European Union. If we do it right, compromises that put environmental integrity at risk are not acceptable to us. The decisions we take at COP25 must prevent the double counting of emission reduction. And to achieve this, the rules must account comprehensively for all uses of international carbon markets. The decisions we take in Madrid should also create strong incentives to reduce emissions now and in the future. And this means avoiding the use of past emission reductions to undermine current and future ambitions. The new mechanism under Article 6.4 should avoid the weaknesses of the Kyoto Protocol mechanism. Second, our other substantive priority for COP25 is the successful review of the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage to stimulate practical ideas that help people on the ground to take effective action to avert, minimize and address loss and damage, particularly for vulnerable communities in their specific situations. And third, the European Union attaches great importance to stakeholder engagement in COP25, particularly on oceans. The Chilean presidency has made this a top priority for this blue COP. But in Madrid, we must be begin looking at the bigger picture and how we and all other parties to the Paris Agreement 
respond to the increasing request from citizens everywhere in the world for more and more decisive action. We believe that in Madrid we must continue to incentivize, support and accelerate action from all actors towards the objectives of the Paris Agreement. The European Union will continue to do its homework on this and will continue to lead by example. Next year, we will update our nationally determined contribution to make it clear that the full implementation of our legislative framework will effectively enable us to overreach the current commitment of at least 40 percent and is estimated to reach around 45 reductions by 2030. But yet, this is not the whole story. We will make clear that the European Union is irrevocably committed to a path that will lead to do our full part under the Paris Agreement and will offer others an effective model to do their part. The European Union will be at their side offering a full cooperation of support. European Union leaders have committed to finalising their guidance on the objectives of climate neutrality by the end of the year, in good time for the long-term strategy to, this, to be submitted to the UNFCCC in early 2020. The objective remains to create a modern, competitive, prosperous and climate neutral society by 2050. At the same time, the demands of our citizens have sparked the European institutions to look again at what we need to do already in the 2030 perspective. The next European Commission has already announced that it will work in earnest to raise the European Union ambition higher than 40 or 45 greenhouse gas emission reductions by 2030. For the European Union, this is a continuous process that can only stop when the objectives of the Paris Agreement are fully reached. Our efforts in this direction will continue well beyond our borders. The European Union and its member states remain the largest contributor of public climate finance to developing countries, including to the multilateral climate funds, and have contributed 21.7 billion euros in climate finance for 2018, which is double the level of 2013. Yet, we all know that public finance alone will be insufficient to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Therefore, it is crucial to make swift and ambitious progress to make all finance flows consistent with the Paris Agreement. To this end, following this action plan on financing sustainable growth, the Commission launched in October the International Platform for Sustainable Finance in order to deepen international cooperation and, where appropriate, coordination on sustainability approaches and initiatives for the capital markets. At the same time, we will continue to mainstream climate policies in all our international relations and our development cooperation. We will continue to persuade others to follow the path of climate neutrality as soon as possible in the second half of this century, as science incites all of us to do, and we will offer all our partners dialogue, cooperation and support in doing so. Honourable Members, let me conclude by saying that we should all offer our strong support to the Chilean COP25 presidency with a view to a successful outcome in Madrid. At the end of this session, let me take the opportunity to thank you for your exceptional collaboration over the last years. It has been an honour to serve in the Juncker Commission and a special privilege to work with such dedicated parliamentarians here in the European Parliament. I am at the same time humbled by all what we have achieved in these past five years and proud of the leadership that the European Union and its institutions have shown at home and abroad and in multilateral forum. Together, we have achieved historic milestones, from the adoption and ratification of the Paris Agreement through the conclusion of a comprehensive legal framework on climate and energy in the form of the 2030 legislation and the Clean Energy Package, all that with exceptional political consensus and support in both the European Parliament and in the Council of Ministers. This is exactly the European Union at its best, an excellent example of the European Union added value for our citizens. What we have achieved puts in place a solid foundation for the next decades to enable us to go further and faster as demanded by our European citizens. Because all we have done is alone, it is not enough. And again, Europe and its institutions must take the lead in going forward. I will remain your strongest supporter as you embark on this important task in the years ahead. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Now I would like to give the floor to the author for five minutes, Mr. Kofan, please. Monsieur le Ministre, Monsieur le Commissaire, chers collègues, nous sommes à quelques jours après la catastrophe climatique de Venise. 
Nous sommes quelques semaines après la confirmation par les États-Unis de Donald Trump de leur retrait de l'accord de Paris. Et nous sommes maintenant à quelques heures du vote en faveur de la nouvelle Commission européenne qui aura lieu dans deux jours, qui a fait du Green Deal, de l'action pour la lutte contre le dérèglement climatique, la biodiversité, une de ses priorités. Et nous sommes aussi à quelques jours de la COP25. Il n'y a donc pas de meilleur moment pour avoir ce débat et pour déclarer l'état d'urgence climatique et environnementale en Europe. Nous sommes à Strasbourg lundi soir. Nous devons voter sur l'état d'urgence climatique et environnementale jeudi. Et je veux le dire aujourd'hui aux citoyens européens qui suivent nos débats. Nous n'avons, au moment où nous parlons, pas de certitude. Pas de certitude que jeudi, ce Parlement se prononcera pour l'état d'urgence climatique et environnementale. Pourtant, plusieurs parlements nationaux l'ont fait. Le Royaume-Uni, l'Irlande, la France, le Portugal, l'Autriche et d'autres, avec des majorités politiques très différentes. Je crois que ce serait incompréhensible, incompréhensible, par les citoyens européens et particulièrement par les jeunes européens, ceux qui se sont massivement déplacés aux élections européennes, pour faire entendre une voix forte, qui est de dire ne nous laissez pas tomber. On a 20 ans aujourd'hui. En 2050, on aura passé toute notre vie. On aura 50 ans. Et ce que vous voulez nous laisser, c'est un monde à 3 degrés, 4 degrés, 5 degrés de réchauffement climatique Si on ne veut pas ça, si on veut envoyer ce message à nos enfants, à tous nos enfants, y compris aux miens, alors nous devons voter dans trois jours l'état d'urgence climatique et environnementale. Et ce serait encore une fois une opportunité extraordinaire à l'inverse. Si nous étions, nous, ici au Parlement européen, le premier Parlement continental à dire l'Europe est le premier continent de ce monde à déclarer l'état d'urgence environnementale et climatique. C'est une opportunité extraordinaire, un message extraordinaire à envoyer à nos citoyens européens, bien évidemment, mais aussi aux citoyens du reste du monde. Parce que après le message que Donald Trump leur a envoyé, qui consiste grosso modo à leur dire « allez vous faire foutre », eh bien nous, nous devons envoyer exactement le message inverse. Nous, on s'intéresse à eux, on s'intéresse à la question climatique pour nos citoyens, mais pour l'ensemble des citoyens du monde, parce que cela a été rappelé aujourd'hui, le premier donneur d'aide publique au développement, c'est l'Union européenne et on peut en être fier. Et donc ce message, il est symbolique. Il ne va pas tout changer du jour au lendemain, évidemment, tout le monde en a conscience. Mais si nous échions à, do à donner ce message, à envoyer ce message, alors la symbolique serait terrible. Et donc j'en appelle à la responsabilité de chacun des parlementaires de ce Parlement. Je dis, nous devons voter, et le plus largement possible. Ce n'est pas une question partisane, ce n'est pas une question de petite politique partisane, c'est une question de responsabilité collective. Nous devons voter, comme d'autres collègues nationaux l'ont fait, l'état d'urgence climatique et environnementale. Et à court terme, nous avons aussi une résolution pour la COP25 et pour la nouvelle Commission européenne qui arrive dans quelques semaines en responsabilité. L'un des grands messages que nous devons envoyer à travers cette résolution, et je suis confiant sur le fait que nous allons l'envoyer, c'est que nous devons réduire nos propres émissions de CO2 bien au-delà bien au-delà des objectifs actuels qui ont été rappelés par le commissaire Cagnetté et qui sont très en dessous de ce que la science nous demande de faire. Et donc ce que l'on doit faire, c'est de réduire de 55% nos émissions de gaz à effet de serre en 2030 comparé à 1990. C'est ce que la science nous demande de faire. C'est parce que l'émotion nous dicte, c'est parce que l'irrationalité nous demanderait ou exigerait de nous c'est ce que les scientifiques nous demandent de faire et je pense qu'en tant que responsable politique de gauche, du droite, du centre, nous devons écouter ce message scientifique et écouter le message des jeunes et donc soutenir dans la résolution pour la COP25 cette exigence de réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre de moins 55%. J'espère que jeudi, chers collègues, nous serons à la hauteur de l'histoire qui est devant nous. Bravo.